All right. Um, we'll start out today, because it's a Monday, we'll do a, a band pick of the week. Um, and this is, uh, band pick of the week is Matty Pryor. Anybody heard of Maddie Pryor? Okay. Um, she's uh, 73 years old. Um, she is the lead singer for, and has been for decades, of uh, uh, um, what is it? Steel Eyes Bam. And uh, what they are is a a Celtic rock band. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with that uh, that terminology, um, but uh, anybody heard of a band called Fairport Convention? Um, yeah, you really should be familiar with Celtic rock. I mean, it's really uh, a, an interesting genre of music that I think you guys would like. Anyway, um, take a look at uh, just you know uh, put in a Maddie Pryor and take a look at. Uh, you know, take a listen through Spotify or, or uh, Pandora or whatever, and uh, take a listen to her. You might want to take a listen to the to the band itself. Um, and uh, but then again, yeah, you should. You know, this uh, um, genre of uh, Celtic rock is uh, is really an interesting genre. All right, um, I'm going to uh, go ahead and. Uh, take roll today. Um, so let's start out with Joel Austin. Okay, uh, Caroline Beal. Uh, Paul Brophy. Uh, Andrew. Uh, Emma Burbeck. Okay, um, Brennan Bush. Uh, Christopher Butters. Where is Christopher? There you are. Okay. Um, Leo. Uh, Ian Calvert. Elizabeth Dickinson. Uh, Claire. Where are you? Okay. Um, Audrey. Uh, Benjamin Hansen. Um, Daniel Harmon. Uh, Patton Harmon. Uh, Peter Harrigan. Uh, Claire Herzl, uh, Maggie, uh, Maggie Hunt Ronrick, okay, uh, Joshua Hypes, uh, Justin Johnson, Justin, uh, Jack Ketchum, uh, Meredith, uh, Thomas McGinnis, uh, Cecilia Moran, okay. uh, Sabrina, uh, Gabriel Powell, um, Benjamin Raffin, okay. uh, Laura Rhine. Is that right again, Ryan? Okay. Okay. Uh, Jack Robinson, uh, Caleb Sampson, uh, Mark Sherman. Uh, Edward Skies, Andrew Vabrugge, Vabrugge, is that right? Close enough? Okay, Maggie Wackenhut, okay. Uh, uh, Dana Weidinger, and Jonathan Welker. All right, okay, so um, last time we were talking about opportunity cost and making the point that um, when you're making decisions, you have to uh, think through the opportunity cost of things. Uh, and we used it to explain a whole number of things, you know, uh, again, why wealthy people don't ride the bus, because the opportunity cost of their time is high. Um, and so uh, we talked about that when you're making a policy decision, uh, you can't ignore what the opportunity cost of things are. Uh, you may decide that you want to do this because the gain from doing this is greater than the, the added benefit, bigger than the added cost, right? But you want to make sure that you've included in the added cost what the opportunity cost of your time is. So if you were to um, 
uh, and we'll talk about profit here a little bit later on, but let's say you've uh, got the uh, Hillsdale Brewing Company and your accountant says you had uh, $50,000 in profit, um, but you could have earned $60,000 working as the manager of the Burger King, uh, then you actually, the opportunity cost you needed to get included in what your, your costs are. So one, just make sure that, that you're, um, you can use it to explain things, but we also wanna make sure that you're including all the costs that you have. So uh, again, if you, uh, we noted that if you don't pay the opportunity cost, then you're gonna, you're gonna waste things, right? Cause you're gonna, if, if, if you don't have any opportunity cost, you're gonna do things till the marginal benefit's zero, right? If the added cost of another gallon of water is zero to you, you'll just keep using it until the marginal benefit's zero. Um, and in general, the marginal cost of actually producing the water is going to be greater than zero. It's just that you're not, uh, you're not having to pay it. So um, notice that if you're a government official and you're, you know, you're on the Senate Appropriations Committee, then if you are the government, the government's got to know what the opportunity costs of resources are, right? So if the government is going to uh, uh, spend uh, appropriations, it has to know the opportunity cost of things. Or if the government's going to have a regulation uh, that says that um, if you are a, um, you know, if you're a, a club uh, and, uh, you know, or a, let's say you're a fitness club. Okay, um, when the governor is making decisions about what the benefit from uh, having the COVID uh, restrictions on whether uh, you know exercise clubs or fitness clubs can operate, you look, you can look at the benefits from that, but then you also have to look at what's the cost of that, what's the opportunity cost, what if that small businesses is uh, are going out of business, uh, and you'll note that. Um, with shutdown, uh, that who lost from that is relatively small businesses tend to lose from that, right? Because, uh, you know, a number of reasons, but Walmart's, I don't know if you look at the stock market, but Walmart stock's been doing very well. Um, but small businesses, uh, you know, are struggling uh, because they're not as able to overcome some of the, the, the opportunity cost of not being able to uh, operate or whatever. So uh, again, when you're making a decision from a uh, public policy point of view, uh, you want to make sure that you are uh, that you in the in the legislature or you in the executive branch uh, are including all the opportunity costs of your decisions, and that means you're going to have to know a little bit more than uh, you might think. Um, another thing is that I can't pay a resource more than the value of what it produces, right? I mean, just logically, um, right? I can't pay a resource more than its, than its added value. Now, notice that I have to pay a resource its opportunity cost, right? Or else I can't get it. If I am, uh, and so, you know, think, think through that, but I have to pay it, it's opportunity cost. And what is that? That's its value in the next best alternative. So we have a system that we said what? It's based on voluntary exchange, right? So if the system, a market system, is based on voluntary exchange, then in order for me to get the steel, uh, let's say I'm going to buy steel from uh, a company, Steel Dynamics, okay? If the Steel Dynamics could get $110 a, a ton for steel, I can't pay them 80, right? Because that's not meeting their opportunity cost. They can say, hey, I can get 110 from Ford Motor Company. So if I actually have obtained the steel, if I have actually obtained your labor, if I've obtained all the resources, I must have paid their value in the next best alternative, right? So if you're a producer, what is happening? If you're a producer, then you must have paid 
the value in the next best alternative for all your resources, right? So a producer pays the value in the next best alternative for all the resources. Whether it's inputs or it's labor or whatever. Then what I just noted is that I can't pay more than the added value, right? I, I, I can't pay more than what, your, uh, what, what I'm getting for the steel. If, if buying that steel for $110, if that steel only allows me to add $90 worth of value, then I'll go out of business. So what does that mean? It means that in a market economy, resources are used in the most efficient manner to please consumers. Right, if we have this system, right, resources are used in the most efficient way to please consumers. Because if what happens is I spend $1,000 on resources, including the opportunity cost of my time, Okay, but if I spend $1,000 on the resources that we're using up, and I only make things that you guys value at 900, the way the system works is I'll go out of business, right? You don't, uh, you know, and we've, we've said this, you, you can't lose money on every unit and make it up in volume, right? But, you know, if you go out and start your own business, what do you learn? You're going to learn that, hey, I got I, I, I to gotta sell my product at enough value that you know, consumers value it sufficiently, they're willing to pay so much for it, I gotta sell it at that value, and that value's gotta be greater than what I paid for the resources, which is their value in the next best alternative. So the logic of that says, how can there be a more efficient way of allocating resources to consumer demand, right? There can't be, just the logic of it. The way it works is you have to pay the value of the next best alternative for whatever the resources are, and then you've got to make something consumers value even more or you go out of business, right? So just the logic of it says um, if I, uh, I, have to, um, I have to produce something consumers value more, or I go out of business, right? So just the logic of that says, okay, if that's the way the system works, right? If it's a system of voluntary exchange, I gotta pay people the value of the next best alternative the, for their time or for their steel or for the um, electricity or whatever, right? And then I got to make something consumers value even more or I go out of business, okay? So just the logic of that alone says that this must be the most efficient way uh, of, uh, of producing and meeting consumer demand. All right. Um, so that leads us to the next topic, which is supply, right? So we've done demand, right? We looked at... We, you know, we did some marginal analysis. People do things as long as the added benefit is bigger than the added cost, right? And we looked at demand, and we said that demand was your marginal benefit schedule, right? And it's downward sloping because we assume that you have diminishing marginal benefits, at least after some point. Um, and so we had a downward sloping demand curve, which was the marginal benefit curve. Uh, and we said that, why is it marginal benefit? Because if I say, the price is $5, how many would you buy? You're gonna say, well, I'll keep buying until the marginal benefit's five. So you're gonna tell me if I'm gonna buy six units, you're telling me that the marginal benefit must have been equal to six at $5. And so the, it, it, it must be your, uh, your demand curve is your marginal benefit curve. Well, what we're gonna do on the supply side of things is we're gonna end up with very similar circumstance. So if we look at supply, what is that? We said demand was the relationship between 
price and how much people are willing and able to buy, right? It's the demand is the whole curve. Same thing on the supply, sir, the supply side. Um, it is a schedule, right, of how much suppliers will supply at various prices. Right? So again, the supply, just as demand was the whole schedule, and quantity demanded was a point on the demand curve, and we talked about things that move the demand curve, are you willing to buy more or less at the same price? We're going to do the exact same thing here, Well, then we're going to talk about it on the supply side of things, how much producers uh, are, willing to, uh, are, are willing to offer at all the various prices. So what we're going to do, we assumed that we started out assuming the demand curve sloped down, and then we said, why would that happen? Because we've assumed that you have diminishing marginal benefits at least after some point. Uh, and so that gives you that the demand curve is going to be sloping down. We're going to get that the supply curve slopes up. And so if I were to put price here and quantity here, and I'm looking at the supply curve for an individual firm, it's going to be uh, upward sloping that way. So why is that? Well, if the supply curve for your firm, we say, you know, you're the, um, I don't know, you're producing rugs, uh, and uh, the supply curve says at, at this price, how many rugs will you supply? What are you going to say? Right? You're going to say, um, I'm going to produce until the marginal benefit is equal to the marginal cost. Right? But just as we said on the demand curve side, the marginal cost to you is the price that you pay. If you're the supplier, it's the marginal benefit to you, right? If I sell another rug at $10, if the price of rugs is $10, I'll keep selling rugs until I get to where the marginal cost is 10, and then I'll stop. Okay? So, um, so what that means is uh, your supply curve is the marginal cost, right? You'll keep, you'll keep selling units or you keep producing units until the price, which is your marginal benefit, is equal to your marginal cost. So if I say, how many rugs will you supply at, uh, you know, let's say uh, $5 a square foot, you'll go over here and say, well, I'll produce five of them, right? Uh, I'll keep, because the marginal benefit to you is whatever you're going to get from the price. Now, when, we, uh, when you take Econ 202, you assume that people are price takers, right? I mean, that's one of the things that we talk about in a competitive industry. That is, you don't get to affect the market price. Just as we said, when you take your corn down to the elevator at Maumee, right, you, 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 you don't affect what the market price is. They tell you, you know, $3.25 a bushel for corn. Okay, uh, so you, you know what that same here is that if you're a, a supplier, um, you can sell as, you, you can sell units uh, as long as the, uh, the the marginal benefit to you is the is the price that you're going to get. So you're a price taker and as a supplier uh, uh, as a as a price taker. So um, why do we assume that marginal uh, the marginal cross increases? increases as Q increases, at least after some point. Right? That's what's giving us the upward slope to the, to the supply curve. Now, uh, we already said that conceptually, you can't have marginal costs going down forever. Otherwise, you'd be able to make things for free. Right? So at some point, that marginal cost curve's got to start increasing. Okay? But let's just even think about it. Given the size of your facility, okay, so you build a restaurant. Okay? So uh, I have some sort of restaurant. 
Given its size, what's going to happen? The marginal cost must go up at some point, right? So how much does it cost to make the first meal? Well, I got to build a restaurant or I either got to build it or I got to buy the building or I got to rent the space or whatever. So even to produ produce that first meal, I've got some what we call fixed costs. I've got some cost no matter what the amount is. Uh, and so, um, uh, and then I got to hire people uh, to, you know, be waiters or waitresses or whatever. Uh, and I got to buy the uh, inputs for the, for the meals that I'm going to be making, right? So uh, it may be that at the beginning, the marginal cost is going down. Right? So we, it makes sense to say uh, uh, at the beginning or at the first few units, we'll say it that way, um, at the first few units, marginal cost could be declining. Okay? So if I were to draw the marginal cost curve, if I had dollars up here and I had uh, Q here, and I'm drawing what marginal cost is, it would make sense maybe that that marginal cost curve would be going down for a while. But at some point, here's what's going to happen. At some point, then, you got to uh, pay overtime, right? Or you have to offer higher wages to get more workers. Um, or you have to uh, do some uh, uh, extra, extra seating. You've got to buy more tables. Okay? You can think of all sorts of things that m would happen as you tried to produce more, given what the size of your facility is. So given the size of your facility, what ought to happen is it ought to look like this. Right? So the marginal cost curve is, gonna, is going to be upward sloping at, at least uh, uh, after some point. Um, so again, you have this intuition that says, oh, gee, um, isn't it cheaper to make lots of units uh, than if you have, uh, you know, if you're making a few units, like, a, you know, might a big factory, might it not, uh, you know, our intuition is that the added cost of the next unit ought to be low if I've got a really big factory. Right? So it ought to always, so that the marginal costs ought to be going down. Um, but that's because we're, you're not thinking of the, the different sizes of the facility will give you the different marginal costs. So a small facility, at some point, the marginal cost is going to go up. But then the same thing's going to happen if you have a large factory, at some point, to produce more units, you've reached the the, the capacity of the factory, at some point, again, you got to pay overtime. Uh, you got to, uh, you know, uh, uh, you have to find uh, um, you know, the input prices that you know are starting to go up. It's going to cost you more for, you know, you're buying so much steel or whatever. So if what you were to do is draw a picture that tells that story, this is what we call economies of scale. Economies of scale says that if I increase the size of my facility, then I'll have lower marginal costs at higher volumes. So if I were to draw that picture, let's say I have one size of facility and its marginal cost looks like this. Okay? And then I build a bigger facility. Okay, so this is uh, a, a smaller factory. Then I have a bigger factory, but what's going to happen here is this is the bigger factory. S but notice then if we put dollars here and we have quantity here, if I'm going to produce this much, right, if that's the, you know, uh, we'll call that Q2 or whatever, the marginal cost in this is way lower than the marginal cost 
of that smaller facility. Okay? So that makes sense. But what if you're only making this amount? The marginal cost of that bigger facility is going to be higher than it is for the smaller facility. Okay? So if you're not making very much of the stuff, you're better off having a small facility. And given the size of the facility, eventually that marginal cost is going to be rising. Economies of scale say, hey, if you're making a lot, you should be in a bigger facility, right? If you're making amounts, if you sort of look at it, if you're making amounts from here on, your, the marginal cost is going to be lower under the, uh, under the larger factory. So that's why your intuition is, oh, it, you know, it must owe, you know, marginal cost, why do they ever go, why do they ever go up, right? It seems like they ought to be, always ought to be lower if you're small, if you're in a bigger facility. But given the size of the facility, what's going to happen is the marginal costs are going to, going to be higher at the beginning and then they're going to go down, they're going to be going down and then they start going up again, okay? So if I'm going to double the size of my factory, what's the added cost of the next unit given I'm starting in this size of facility to, to produce the next unit, what do I got to do? I got to build a whole new factory, right? So the added cost of that next unit. So we were talking about power plant, right? A nuclear power plant. Producing that first unit of power is going to cost billions of dollars to build a nuclear power plant. But once there, the marginal cost of the next unit ought to be really low. But eventually you get to where the you're, you're uh, met the, the uh, capacity of the nuclear power plant, then what do you got to do? Well, then you got to have a, uh, maybe a gas-fired backup. You got to uh, do all sorts of things to make it so that you can increase the size of the facility. And so the marginal cost must eventually go up. All right? So if the marginal costs are rising, what does that give you? That gives you a, uh, a uh, upward sloping supply curve. Right? How much are you willing to produce at this price? How much are you willing to produce that, that, that price? Um, uh, and in Econ 202, you're going to talk about long run marginal cost and short run marginal cost. And in the long run, you can alter the size of your facility in the short run that you can't. Okay. So that's just a matter of saying, given where I am right now in the short run, here's what my marginal cost is going to look like. If I'm making a decision, uh, how many you know, millions am I going to produce, and I have, now I can go out and build a new facility, then you're going to go to wherever that long run marginal cost uh, is, is going to be lower. All right. Um, Notice that, um, again, we, uh, it makes sense that you can't have marginal costs con uh, going to zero, right? So at some point, intuitively, that marginal cost is going to be going up. All right, one last comment on the marginal cost is to notice, again, you'll, this will come up in Econ 202, um, is that the marginal cost must uh, hit the, uh, the average total cost at the minimum of the average total cost. And what is average total cost? Average total cost is, it's like we might expect, it is the total cost divided by quantity. So if it costs you $100 to make 10 units, including the cost of the factory and everything else, the, the average cost is going to be 100 divided by 10 or $10. Okay? So notice that if we were to draw the picture, if we put dollars here and quantity here, what ought to happen is the average total cost will be going down for a while, and then it's going to be going up. That is, the, I'm spreading the, the cost of the 
of the facility or whatever out over more units. So for a while, the added cost is going, the, the average total cost is going down, but at some point it's going to start rising. And where would that be? That would be where if the marginal cost is um, less than the average total cost, what ought to be happening? It must be pulling the average down. Sort of, you know, just intuitively, that if the cost of the next unit is less than the average, then I must be bringing the average down, right? If the marginal cost is bigger than the average, I must be pulling the average up. So if the average cost is $10 and the marginal cost of the next one is eight, then I must be pulling the average down. If the average cost is 12 and the marginal cost is 14, the cost of the next unit is 14, I must be bringing the average up. So what ought to happen then is the marginal cost is going to hit that average cost at its minimum. So again, when you take Econ uh, 202, that's one of the things when you draw the cost curve for a firm, when you draw the cost curve for a firm, what are you going to do? It's going to look like this. The marginal cost is going to hit the average total cost at its minimum. Um, so. Uh, and notice again, would I ever produce where the marginal cost was declining, right? Suppose that I had, suppose the marginal cost curve looks like this, which is what we think it's going to look like generally. Again, when you take you down 202 and you draw the picture of the marginal cost and average total cost for firms, you're probably going to have the marginal cost declining because, again, there's some fixed cost to having the factory, there's some fixed cost to having the power plant or whatever. So the marginal cost is going to be going down for a while, but then it's going to start going up. So if, we're, if we've got dollars here and we have Q here and we're looking at what's the supply curve look like, It's not going to have any point here, right? Because suppose that that's a Q1. That, the downward sloping part of the marginal cost curve isn't where you're going to produce, right? Because the marginal cost of that unit is over here. So I can produce this many units for all those units this is the price I'm going to get, right? So this, if we're, if we're looking at what's, what, what's the price that you're getting, because that's your marginal benefit. If the price that you're getting is, let's say, $3 here, okay, I'm not going to produce Q1, right? Because each of these units, each of these units has a marginal cost which is less than the marginal benefit, right? Because I'm getting the, whatever the price is, uh, that's what I'm getting. So my marginal benefit's the price. If, I, if, if you ask me how much are you willing to produce at $3, I'm not going to tell you this amount. I'm only going to tell you that amount. So when we look, actually look at the supply curve, it's the upward sloping part. If we draw, just draw a picture, it's the upward sloping part of, of the marginal cost curve. Okay, so when I'm drawing a supply curve for an individual firm, uh, uh, it's going to be that part of the, uh, su the uh, supply curve, uh, which is the, or that portion of the marginal cost curve, which is upward sloping. So, now we might say, okay, when we talked about demand curve, we said, okay, what, what sort of things affect where that demand curve was, right? And we said, Preferences, right? If we change people's preferences, um, uh, we, it'll al alter what it is. If we talk about the price of substitutes, um, the price of complements, how much income you have, right? 
talked about uh, normal goods and inferior goods, and we said that for the market as a whole, we add up everybody's demand curves to get to the, to the market demand. Similarly, you might want to think about, and, and when we're talking about those characteristics, what are we saying? Will it change your answer to how much you're willing to buy at the same price, right? If I change your tastes, I'll change the answer of how much you're willing to buy at this price. Or if I change your income, you know, uh, how many, uh, uh, you know, how, how many bottles of, uh, of wine, of this kind of wine would you buy at, at this price? If I change your preferences for wine, I'll change how much you're willing to buy at that same price. Same story here. Now I'm saying, how many units will you produce at that price? Because at that price, that's the marginal benefit to you. Um, and so you're going to keep producing things as long as the marginal cost is bigger than the marginal benefit. So what are you going to do? You're going to get to the point where that supply curve is the marginal cost curve, which is where, uh, in that range where the marginal cost curve is upward sloping. So what affects the supply curve? And again, when you look at the old exams, which you might have looked at already, um, you'll see that there's always, the, as I mentioned before, that 10-point question that's going to, you're going to start out with some equilibrium, and then I'm going to tell you a story that's either going to change what happens to the demand curve, or it could change what's happening to the supply curve, and then you got to tell me what's going to happen to the price and quantity. Okay? Uh, and so if we look at from the supply curve side, let's think about what determines what that curve looks like. Well, the first thing is the price of inputs, right? The price of labor, the price of, uh, let's say you're a restaurant, how many, uh, you know, you're the, uh, well, there's a Coney, uh, Coney's and Squirrels down here, right? So you can buy uh, uh, Coney, Coney Island hot dogs at the Coney's and Squirrels place, right? How many hot dogs will they supply at $1.25? Depends on what the cost of whatever you make hot dogs out of. It probably depends, but, um, you know, let's say you make them, uh, uh, what do you make hot dogs out of? Uh, pork, okay? Um, what the, the price of pork is going to affect if the price of pork goes from $2 a pound to $15 a pound, it's going to reduce the amount of hot dogs you're going to supply at $1.98 or $1.50, right? Or if the price of labor goes up. If the price of labor rises, then the, it's going to cost you more to produce the next unit. And so what would we expect? We would expect that you'll produce less at the same price. So an increase in the price of inputs will cause the supply curve will shift left. You know, the, what's the story? The story says that at the same price, I'm going to produce less units because the, you just increase that marginal cost curve for me. And so I'm going to hit that marginal cost curve at a lower Q than it was when the marginal cost curves were, the, where the marginal cost was lower. So if I do something that increases the marginal cost, which would be the price of inputs, then I'm going to change what's going to happen to that supply curve. Just as we said that when I'm looking at things that affect your market, that, that your individual demand for a good, if I do something um, that changes what your added benefit is, uh, then I'm going to uh, I'm going to affect where that demand curve is. So if I, if I look at the price of inputs, I'm going to shift that supply curve to the left. And of course, if it goes down, I'm going to shift it to the right. So what does that tell you? I mean, sort of think about it. If I do something, suppose that I were to pass a law that says that if you hire labor, then you have to uh, provide health insurance for them. Okay. What's going to happen? I'm going to, which is what happened under the Affordable Care Act, 
right? Under the Affordable Care Act, one of the things that it did was it made it so that if you hire somebody, if you're a certain size firm, and you hire somebody, you have to provide health insurance for them, which you didn't have to do before. So what did that do? That increased the price of the input, right? If I have a robot, if I have a drone that's delivering things rather than somebody driving around delivering things, what's going to happen, right? I don't have to pay healthcare costs for that drone. Why do you think that Amazon is just got approval? Amazon, I don't know if you follow this. Amazon just got approval to start uh, um, testing, uh, uh, delivering things with drones, right? Uh, and Walmart also uh, has, a, I think Walmart also has the ability to test uh, delivering things with drones. Um, why do you think that's happening, right? Uh, one of the reasons that might be happening is because I've increased the price of the input of labor. Um, and so, uh, again, you sort of think about it, I'm going to, we haven't talked about this, so we'll talk more about this later on, but I'm also going to substitute, just as when I'm looking at a demand curve, if what happens is you increase the price of substitutes, they're going to shift the demand curve for something else to the right or the left. So if I'm increasing the price of a substitute, it's going to drive the demand curve to the right. If I increase the price of labor, I'm going to drive the demand curve for, uh, for machinery to the right. Okay? So if I do something that increases uh, the price of an input, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm going to... Uh, move that supply curve to the left. So what are you saying? It says, okay, basically, here's my supply curve, and here's price and quantity, and then if I raise the price of, a, of labor, that supply curve is going to shift to the left. So we know if I have a regulation that does something to increase the price of labor, you have to do this if you hire somebody, uh, you have to provide them with this or that or the other thing, okay, that's going to change where that supply curve is. Second thing that might be obvious as well is the technology of production. Right? The technology of production. How you make things. So, if we were to look at the price of computers, okay? the price of computers, when I was in graduate school, um, the price of computers was, the, was uh, several hundred million dollars for one computer. Right? Now, today, you can buy a computer, uh, which you guys call a phone, um, but really is a computer that has a little phone attached to it, right? Um, you can buy one of those for, I mean, they may give them away if you, uh, you know, if you subscribe to, uh, uh, you know, some, you know, uh, Verizon or something, they may give you a phone, right? So, I mean, that maybe, I mean, if you buy an expensive phone computer, it might be $1,000 or something, right? Uh, I know you can buy a laptop computer uh, at Walmart uh, for less than $500, right? Which is more powerful than the Control Data Corporation, the CDC 6400 that we had at Berkeley uh, in, uh, in the early 1970s and mid 1970s, okay? Why is that? Because the way you make computers is vastly different than the way you made computers then. Right? The technology of producing computers is very different than it was uh, back in the, in the 1970s. So when the notice that the technology of production tends to advance things, right? You tend to, you, you tend to discover ways of doing things where the technology, I got an incentive to invent a way of doing it where the cost of producing things is now lower. So this tends to advance, right? Uh, we tend to advance. So what happens? The technology production makes it so that it should shift to the right. Now, 
now, anybody ever seen the movie Planet of the Apes? Okay, so some of you have seen Planet of the Apes, right? What happens? Er, they go backwards, right? They forget how to do stuff, right? <laughs> they, you think they're on a different planet, but they're not, right? What's happened is like we've forgotten how to do stuff. Um, the, uh, uh, Ayn Rand wrote a book called Anthem, uh, where a very similar thing happens, where people forget how to do stuff, right? So you can have science fiction movies, or you can have uh, you know, uh, uh, fantasy books or whatever, where the technology production goes backwards. Um, but generally, that's not what happened. Generally, what happens is it advances, right? It may be that, you know, maybe if you look back to the Middle Ages or something, there might be a period where people forgot how to do stuff or whatever. But generally, we'd expect the technology production to be shifting that supply curve out to the right. Uh, and so if we, when we read How the West Grew Rich, we're going to talk about the Industrial Revolution. And what the Industrial Revolution was about is changing the technology of production. And so if you were to tell a story about the Industrial Revolution, what is it really a story about? It's a story that says we changed the technology of production, and what did that do? Shifted the supply curve out to the right. And of course, uh, we're going to put demand and supply curves together, and that's going to determine what the price is. But just intuitively, um, you, you, if, if the supply curve is shifting out to the right, we would expect to see prices falling. And of course, that's what you observed when you did uh, the Industrial Revolution, right? You had, uh, and, and where, anybody know where did the Industrial Revolution, what, um, what, what was that focused on in terms of uh, the type of goods? It was in like textiles, right? It was in textiles. And so what happened? Clothing becomes a lot less expensive than it used to. Um, because now it, there's a technology that made textiles cheaper to, to make, and so the price of the input fell, and so clothing becomes less expensive. And so what happens? You get closets, right? 1500 you can have a lot of people with closets, right? Rich people might have had closets. Um, today, we have walk-in closets, right? Uh, you got so many clothes that, uh, it was, you know, talked about my wife's shoes. Um, but anyway, uh, the technology of production is affected. A third thing is, um, and it doesn't work for everything, but in some cases, the price of a substitute might affect it, right? So. In some cases, price of a substitute. Easiest thing to think about that, it's where you can, you can, your firm can produce this thing or it can do, produce this thing. So if, uh, let's say you're a farmer, right, and I'm asking you how much, you know, how many uh, uh, bushels of wheat will you produce at a certain price of wheat, but you could also uh, produce corn on that land, then your answer might depend on what happens to the price of corn, right? If the price of corn goes way up, you say, ah, I'm gonna start making corn instead of making wheat, okay? So there are cases where you could think of where the price of a substitute could affect uh, what the supply curve looks like, but it has to be something where you can you, with the same facility, right, you can either produce this or you can produce that, right? Um, how many hot dogs might depend on, you know, for some reason the demand for Beyond Meat goes up and the price of, you know, the people are willing to pay for the demand curve for Beyond Meat hamburgers changes because their preferences change, then what might, might happen? I might produce fewer units of the one, you know, regular hamburgers and I'll make more of the Beyond meat hamburgers, right? So you'd have to be something like uh, something like that. And then just quickly, uh, the last thing um, for the market, it's going to be the number, the number of firms, right? The number of suppliers. Just as the market demand curve is the sum of the individual demand curves, the market supply curve is going to be the sum of the individual supply curves. Right? So the market is the sum of 
to individual supply curves. All right, so um, we're pretty well done with the uh, chapter on supply, um, and then we're going to move into equilibrium. Okay, so equilibrium is going to tell us here's we're going to put the demand curve together, the supply curve together, and we're going to get that price. Right? Okay. So uh, for next time, you might want to read the chapter uh, the chapter on on equilibrium. <laughs>